I first met Juggins, really to notice him, years and years ago as a boy out camping. Somebody was trying to nail up a board on a tree for a shelf, and Juggins interfered to help him. Oh, stop a minute, he said. You need to saw the end of that board off before you put it up. Then Juggins looked around for a saw, and when he got it, he hardly made more than a stroke or two with it before he stopped. This saw, he said, needs to be filed up a bit. So he went and hunted up a file to sharpen the saw, but found that before he could use the file, he needed to put a proper handle on it. And to make a handle, he went to look for a sapling in the bush. <laughs> but to cut the sapling, he found that he needed to sharpen up the axe. <laughs> to do this, of course, he had to fix the grindstone so to make it run. Well. This involved making wooden legs for the grindstone. To do this decently, Juggins decided to make a carpenter's bench. <laughs> this was quite impossible without a better set of tools. <laughs> Juggins went to the village to get the tools required, and of course he never came back. <laughs> he was rediscovered weeks later in the city getting prices on wholesale tool machinery. <laughs> Well, after that first episode, I got to know Juggins very well. For some time, we were students at college together. But Juggins somehow never got far with his studies. He always began with great enthusiasm, and then something happened. For a time, he studied French with tremendous eagerness. But he soon found that for a real knowledge of French, you need first to get a thorough grasp of old French. <laughs> But it proved impossible to do anything with these without an absolutely complete command of Latin. <laughs> this, Juggins discovered, could only be obtained in any thorough way through Sanskrit. Of course, lies at the base of it. So Juggins devoted himself to Sanskrit until he realized that for a proper understanding of Sanskrit, one needed to study the ancient Iranian, <laughs> the root language underneath. This language, however, is lost. <laughs> So Juggins had to begin over again. He did, it is true, make some progress in natural science. He studied physics and rushed rapidly backwards from forces to molecules, from molecules to atoms, and from atoms to electrons. And then his whole studies exploded backwards into the infinities of space, still searching for a first cause. Juggins, of course, never took a degree, so he made no practical use of his education, but it didn't matter. He was very well off and was able to go straight into business with a capital of about $100,000. He put it at first into a gas plant, but found that he lost money at that because of the high price of the coal needed to make gas. So he sold out for $90,000 and went into coal mining. <laughs> this was unsuccessful because of the awful cost of mining machinery. So Juggins sold his share in the mine for $80,000 and went into manufacturing mining machinery. <laughs> At this, he would have undoubtedly made money, but for the enormous cost of gas <laughs> as a motive power for the plant. Juggins sold out of the manufacturer for $70,000, and after that he went whirling in a circle like skating backwards through the different branches of allied industry. <laughs> he lost a certain amount of money each year, especially in good years, when trade was brisk. In dull times, when everything was unsaleable, he did fairly well. <laughs> Juggins' domestic life was very quiet. <laughs> of course, he never married. He did, it is true, fall in love several times, but each time it ended without result. I remember well his first love story, for I was very intimate with him at the time. He had fallen in love with the girl in question utterly and immediately. It was literally love at first sight. There was no doubt of his intentions. As soon as he had met her, he was quite frank about it. I intended, he said to her, ask her to be my wife. When? I asked. Right away? No, he said. Oh, no, I want first to fit myself to be worthy of her. So he went into moral training to fit himself. <laughs> he taught in a Sunday school for six weeks, and he realized that a man has no business in divine work of that sort without first preparing himself by serious study of the history of Palestine. <laughs> The man was a cad to force a society on a girl while he is still only half acquainted with the history of the Israelites. <laughs> so, Juggins stayed away. It was nearly two years before he was fit to propose. But at the time he was fit, the girl had already married a brainless thing in patent leather boots who didn't even know who Moses was. <laughs> of course, Juggins 
<laughs> well, again, people always do. <laughs> At any rate, by this time, he was in a state of moral fitness that made him imperative. <laughs> so he fell in love, deeply in love this time, with a charming girl, commonly known as the eldest Miss Thornycroft. <laughs> she was only called eldest because she had five younger sisters. And she was very poor and awfully clever. She trimmed all her own hats. Any man, if he's worth the name, falls in love with that sort of thing at the first sight. So, of course, Juggins would have proposed to her, only when he went to the house, he met her next sister. And, of course, she was younger still, and I suppose poorer. He made not only her own hats, but her own blouses. <laughs> so Juggins fell in love with her. But one night when he went to call, the door was opened by the sister younger still, who not only made her own blouses, trimmed her own hats, but even made her own tailor-made suits. After that, Juggins backed up from sister to sister till he went right through the whole family, and in the end, got none of them. <laughs> Perhaps it was just as well that Juggins never married. It would have made things very difficult because, of course, he got poorer all the time. <laughs> you see, after he sold out his last share in his last business, he bought with it a diminishing life annuity, so planned that he always got rather less next year than this year, and still less the year after. <laughs> Thus, if he lived long enough, he would starve to death. <laughs> Meantime, he's become a quaint-looking elderly man with coats a little too short and trousers a little above his boots, like a boy. His face, too, is like that of a boy, with wrinkles. And his talk now has grown to be always reminiscent. He is perpetually telling long stories of amusing times that he has had with different people that he names. He says, for example, I remember a rather queer thing that happened to me in a train one day. And if you say, well, when was that, Juggins? He looked at you in a vague way as if calculating and says, in 1875 or 1876, I think, as near as I can recall. I notice, too, that his reminiscences are getting further and further back. He used to base his stories on his own recollections as a young man. Now they are further back. The other day he told me a story about himself and two people that he called the Harper Brothers, Ned and Joe. Ned, he said, was a tremendously powerful fellow. I asked how old Ned was, and Juggins said that he was three. <laughs> he added that there was another brother, but not so old, but a very clever fellow about, oh, gosh. And here Juggins paused and calculated, about 18 months. <laughs> so then I realized where Juggins' retroactive existence is carrying him to. He has passed back through childhood into infancy, and presently, just as his annuity runs to a point and vanishes, he will back up clear through the curtain of existence and die, or be born. I don't know quite what you'd call it. Meantime, it remains to me as one of the most illuminating allegories I have ever met. <laughs>